Man, your time here is more than just your time in the presidency role, because uh, as we're going to discuss, it goes it goes way further back than that. So let's take it back there. First of all, counting your time as a student, how many years have you been at Louisiana Tech? Well, it's 51 years, plus or minus a little bit. Mm -hmm. So let's go back, I guess, 52, 53 years and talk about high school less yeah. guys in Bastrop, right? I was in Bastrop. That's and right. kind of what sparked your interest in tech and what made tech appealing to you and kind of how you mm -hmm. chose your major and got into the university. You know, I, and even going back in junior high, I got a little bit interested in, in football. Um, coach Charles McDonald was my coach. He turned out to be a member of a board of regents and a personal friend for life. But, you know, he was such a driver for me and, and um, then I just got interested in football. I, we had a really good group of young men that were work, grew together and so went on to Bastrop High School and, and uh, played a little bit, mostly stood on the sidelines, but uh, that was a big part of, of my life. So football was part of it. I was decent academically, but really enjoyed the camaraderie being with people. Mm -hmm. So started knowing that I was going to go to college and I'm really a first generation student. And right. so uh, I didn't know what to fully expect there, but Terry Bradshaw had just been over here, had showed up on the cover of Sports Illustrated when I was a junior in high school. And I said, hey, that, that looks pretty cool. I'll go over and visit with them. And plus I'd, I had always drawn house plans and my dad was a minister and so he was always building churches and so we drawing plans and things like that. And, and Louisiana Tech had put a new architecture program in place and so that brought me here. Mm -hmm. uh, architecture and football and, and the great reputation that the university had, you know. We, we recognized that even at that time. It sounds like maybe we need to thank Terry Bradshaw for indirectly <laughs> kind of coaxing you to come to Louisiana Tech. That's interesting. Um, were there, did you ever consider any other schools or was Tech kind of always your no, first it, and only option? It, it was really Tech. Of course, I had friends going to other universities, LSU, right. and Northeast Louisiana University at that time and, and even out of state. But uh, this is where I knew, once I came to campus once, Mm -hmm. uh, during that junior year of high school, I knew this is where I needed to be. You can ask so many students the same question, and they'll tell you the same thing, that once they visited campus and they got that kind of this is home That's feeling. Right. I'm hearing a lot of that from students that come from South Louisiana or Texas, and they get here on our campus and you know see the experience. It's It really makes a difference. It does. Um, so you go to Tech and you, you're getting this architecture degree. I know that you did not plan at that time to be the president of the university. So what was what was Dr. Geis at this point, what was just Les Geis at this point, planning on doing with this architecture degree? Yeah, well, you know, I was very shy, very timid. Um, I was taking classes in this building, Wiley Tower, mm -hmm. you know, freehand drawing and art and color theory and things like that. And it was a lot of creativity. And, nothing was ever good enough. You always could make it better by spending more time. And so I learned a lot of those kind of principles back then and enjoyed uh, working as we moved on through the architecture program, spending a lot of time with my colleagues in the studios and then going out and doing social things and enjoying football games and things like that. Um, but I, I had a professor there that really inspired me in engineering, and it was Mr. Jack Painter, mm -hmm. uh, who was a president of the Circus Fans Club of America. He juggled balls. He, he was uh, you know something every engineering professor does, he, right? Not, yeah, he was just <laughs> so out there, but he was so caring too. He was tough and high expectations, but he was caring, and uh, he just inspired me and. I decided about halfway through I would go ahead and get my master's in civil engineering. So started taking some of the calculus classes and things like that. that so let I me ask you what what sort of fueled that decision as opposed to switching majors? Like what made you want to finish and get that architecture degree and then go for a master's in engineering? You know, I felt like I needed to get that architecture degree. My goal was to be an architectural engineer, mm -hmm. you know, to have some additional skill sets. I was planning to go to work in Houston for an architecture okay. firm or maybe Atlanta. 
My best friend went to Atlanta and got his master's and did went to Georgia Tech and, and all. So I'd always been looking at those kind of things. But, uh, but the opportunity to have Mr. Painter as my master's advisor and let me start learning some you know, higher level structures, uh, materials was really a sale for me. Was he part of the reason that not only did you decide to get your engineering masters, but you decided to do it here at Tech? Oh, absolutely, yeah, it was, it was good. We had some excellent professors, and so he, it was more than him, but he was my advisor. Um, and while I was going to grad school here, they asked me to teach some classes, mm -hmm. teach some of the structures classes to the architecture students and the construction students. Now, so was, it began, huh? It, it so began it began then, and I was I was shy, and it was hard for me to get in a class in front of twenty five or thirty students. Uh, but after a while, I got comfortable and really began to enjoy that. So. As you started teaching and you start to realize that you kind of have this passion for the classroom, uh, at what point do your kind of career expectations and goals kind of shift? At what point do you decide, I want to get my doctorate, I want to stick around, I want to do teaching? Or are you kind of just going with the flow and kind of making that up as you go along? Well, it, it was, it, there came a decision point I had to make as I got close to the end of the master's degree, whether I was going to go to work in Houston for the architectural engineering firm or or do something else in mm -hmm. my life. And it just so happened, one of our faculty members had passed away a few months earlier and the position came open and the head of the civil engineering department asked me if I would be interested in applying for a position. And I had, you know, that was not on my radar before that. And, uh, and I, I said, I would like that. So I did and could, did that for three years. Uh, led student organizations as well as teaching a bunch of classes mm -hmm. and and, uh, and then figured, you know, if I'm going to be in this, I need to go get a doctorate. And so I took off uh, to Texas A&M for a year and got all my coursework completed. And that, that's, uh, if you look back on your sort of journey, I think that Texas A&M stop might be the one non-tech uh, stop for you. So, uh, not to say that that was a bad decision because it obviously wasn't, but sort of was that, was it important to you to kind of branch away from tech just for a little bit and come back? Like what was the thought process yeah, there? Yeah, I was obviously, you know, being able to get your doctorate at another mm -hmm. top tier university was really important. I thought the culture at Texas A&M was a lot like the culture here, caring faculty, and it proved to be the, the case. And I'd had friends go there as well. So um, it was a pretty easy choice for me. And, I had been developing relationships with the Corps of Engineers over in Vicksburg at the what was called the Waterways Experiment Station back then, doing some big structural research, you know, looking at explosives on command centers and things like that. And and so that began to be the topic for my dissertation. So I, when I came back here, I worked with the Corps of Engineers on some big projects and developed some theories for uh, structural analysis and design that served as a basis for my dissertation. Wow, okay, so you came back here. What, you know, you come back here with your doctorate and you're you're still planning to teach, like how do you want to get back involved with tech and how did you, What was were you kind of just welcome right back with, you know, we have a place for you here and. Yes, I, you know, even though I was at College Station, I was coming back and forth mm -hmm. as frequently as I could and I was really only away for about a year at that period of time and, uh, and so I just came back and dove in to working with student organizations and teaching and being engaged in activities. So when was the sort of next, I guess you could call it a promotion mm -hmm. uh, throughout that sort of career arc for you? Because you're going from, you know, a student to a faculty member and eventually a, a, the president here. So kind of these steps yeah. along the way, what was the next one for you there? So while I was a young faculty member, uh, we recruited in a department head that came from Florida, Barry Benedict, who was also one of the most impactful people in my career. Very creative and talked about different ways to organize faculty and to organize programs. And it led to what we call our integrated engineering and science curriculum. And real creative thinker, just brought a different mindset to everything. Well, he. Uh, got promoted from department head to the dean of engineering mm -hmm. and so the department head position came open and so people suggested that I apply for it. Well I was only 
you know, around 30 years old, and I didn't know that I was qualified to do it necessarily, but I, I did. And and then people like Jack Painter become working for me, so to speak, yeah, you right. know, and, and other very prominent faculty members. And so I never felt myself to be a boss. It's more of, you know, we're leading, let's get together and see what we want to do to make this a better program. And, and uh, that was the real, you know, transformative time for me as working under Dean Barry Benedict and, and really began to look at the new integrated engineering and science curriculum that, uh, you know, serves as a basis for what we do today. With really good faculty members like Dr. Jim Nelson uh, was a big part of that. I think we're gonna find a common theme here with a lot of these sort of promotions throughout your career uh, that you kind of, you didn't self-identify as dean or department head or vice president or whatever, it kind of just, it was, kind of brought to you and you kind of had to stop and think about it. So keep walking us through it. Uh, after the department head, where's kind of the next step up? So, and again, I never really had the aspiration to be dean right. necessarily. Uh, but and let me go back a little bit. While we, I was in civil engineering, I knew that if we were going to be a great civil engineering program, we needed to be distinct in something. And so I hired a young faculty member from Purdue, Tom Isley, not so young, but he's experienced. But he came in with understanding something called trenchless technology. Mm -hmm. And so we created this center in trenchless technology. And he had strong industry engagement and, and we had just all sorts of people coming our way, supporting us and begin to be recognized for that. So I, I really learned that that's what you have to do if you really want to attract great faculty and students, find some ways to connect. And that's still so, a thing here today, right? The Trenchless Technology it's Center. It's still here. It's yeah. going strong. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Trenchless Technology Center board met last week on our campus and uh, very committed to our programs. They'll spend two or three days here and uh, multiple times throughout the year. So when I moved into the Dean of Engineering position, we began to look at the integrated engineering and science curriculum. And uh, the, Dr. Benedict had already founded the Institute for Micromanufacturing. We'd received some funding from the state to put that facility and hire some people. That had happened earlier. Um, and so we now had a couple of really good centers. And of course, Dan Renault had already got us off running with a PhD in biomedical engineering. And so there were these specialty areas like biomedical engineering and trench list technology and micro manufacturing that are, you know, leading edge areas across the country. And it really made it a great way to attract faculty and students and, and just continue to look at those opportunities. Uh, one of the ones that showed up later was uh, Governor Foster uh, established what was called an information technology initiative and they asked five or six universities to uh, submit proposals to get some of that funding. Well, I worked with our Dean of Business and I was Dean of Engineering and said let's create a Center for Entrepreneurship and Information Technology and really uh, build upon this entrepreneurial spirit mm -hmm. uh, that was on the campus but not really able to come forward in any programmatic activities. And, and so we began to do that and started working with intellectual property and uh, really growing the intellectual property and partnerships and uh, engaging students in those activities. And, and the Center for Entrepreneurship and Information Technology grows strong today. Yeah, and it's, you know, we're gonna find this too, as you sort of not rise up the ranks, but you know, your career is evolving in these different roles and you're getting higher and higher up sort of collaboration becomes more necessary, right? You get into a dean position and now you're operating not just within your college, but you're functioning as a part of all the other colleges in a way. Yeah. So. And you know, universities are very structured, right? There's all these departments and programs and all of that. And what tends to happen is people, if you aren't careful, you just focus inward on that. Yeah, silos. That si those silos, thing. absolutely. And so uh, we really put, this is what Dr. Benedict really helped us learn how to do is work across the disciplines, become very interdisciplinary. We actually redid the structure of the College of Engineering and Science. So we no longer had department heads. We had academic directors 
that took high level responsibility over multiple programs. So I became an academic director before Dean of, uh, before I was Dean, I became academic director of civil engineering, chemical engineering and chemistry mm -hmm. and geosciences at that time. Well, I wasn't an expert in those areas, right? but I could lead those areas. And then, it, so there was so much that we did back then that really created this innovative, collaborative environment that advanced our curricula, and it also advanced our research enterprises, which you know is really a strength. When you can get these people with different backgrounds working together, uh, you see a lot of innovation come out of that. Yeah, so speaking of research, uh, this might be a good time for you to walk us up to kind of the transition to, you know, being the dean of research at Louisiana Tech. Yeah. yeah. So President Renault at the time, I was really enjoying being dean of engineering and science, but we had gone without the vice president for research for several years, mm -hmm. and so Dr. Renault approached me and saw, said, "Would you be interested in doing this?" and so we'd begun to develop our research program strong in the College of Engineering and Science. And I said, well, I'll do that. I knew there was a, a good person standing and waiting that might be the Dean of Engineering, Dr. Stan Knapper, uh, came from biomedical engineering. And so it sort of worked out where we, we were able to, to move that forward and uh, begin to really put a focus on research across campus and, and across the state. I, I served and continue to serve as uh, the statewide uh, EPSCOR committee uh, chair, which is research university activities across the state. And I chaired the Louisiana Optical Network Initiative uh, committee uh, but that put the high-speed networks across the state. And we still do a lot of collaboration between our universities because of this infrastructure and mm -hmm. this spirit of cooperation that has taken place across the universities. And so I spent a lot of my time on, on that. And How long were you in that role? I was there about seven or eight years, okay. uh, something like that. But during that time, we began to know we wanted to capitalize on some of these research activities and try to create more partnerships. So I began to work with a, a good friend, uh, Jay Gio, who's a principal with Hunt Gio and Associates. And, uh, we began to look at a master plan for an enterprise campus. Um, and uh, I thought we would go out and do like Research Triangle Park, build something out, standalone thing, maybe on the interstate so people could see it as it passes by. But uh, Jay and a, and a firm that we hired in Boston to do master planning said, you really need to look at a space adjacent to your campus. And of course they identified the space that's right between our campus and downtown Ruston. Mm -hmm. It was a blighted area, you know, old trailer park, concrete plant, bowling alleys, deteriorating housing. Mm -hmm. And so we made that decision and, and approached, uh, President Renault approached the, the legislature and got some money the first year to let us buy uh, that property and, and then had enough money in there to build the first multi-tenant building called Tech Point. Mm -hmm. So that that's how all of that started. Yeah, and we'll get we'll get to sort of the expansion and the growth of that enterprise campus in a little bit. Um, I was going to ask you this later. I'll ask you this now. We're talking about you know getting buildings done and growing our campus. And as somebody with an architecture and engineering background, you know you when you get these sort of architectural renderings, you get these plans. How much of the architect and engineer in you comes out? Because I know you care about this campus and I you do. want these buildings to be the best they can be. So how much of a, of a hand do you have in sort of making those decisions? You know, I, I really don't micromanage those right. things. I think you hire good architects. Each one brings their particular skill sets to the table and, uh, and, and we like to use multiple architects. But I insist that we have some consistency in what we do in terms of color and and form and themes and you know traditions connecting things together uh, making great walkways making uh, beautiful landscapes uh, that really make it uh, pleasant walks noble trees there you, you go know, uh, it's, it's important of who we are 
but I, I enjoy looking at the work. I'll critique them a little bit when architects come in and present sure. their plans. Just like recently, we've been having some uh, serious discussions about the renovation of George T. Madison. And, of course. You know, the building that really needs renovation and what is it going to look like? And you want to do it right. We want so to do it right. Yeah. We want to make it a great learning environment. So we're not just taking walls that, and repainting them and you know, we're trying to redo the inside of the building and create more collaborative learning environments because we know that's how students are going to be successful. And faculty love to, to teach in that way uh, now as opposed to a lot of lecture-based classrooms. I bet this question, uh, your answer to this question might change depending on the day, but uh, what's your favorite building on campus? <laughs> You know, I, I really do. There's a lot of buildings I love, but that integrated engineering and science building was truly special. Um, and not just because kind of the rumblings of the, like the dream of that building happened while you were in sort of that dean yeah. role. Like it, it's been that long in the making. Right? It came about because we needed the kind of environment that supported the integrated engineering curriculum that had been developed by our faculty and all. And they're passionate about it. I didn't do that. They were, I just supported uh, what they wanted. And, and they said, look, Bogart Hall is not the kind of facility we need to teach this way. We need people sitting around tables and letting the faculty member walk around, letting them put things on the tables and build and assemble and do those kind of things. So they came up with uh, some funds. They raised $8 million of private money to put that building in place. and. And it's spectacular now. And just walk through there and it changes the way you think about engineering education. What I'm proud of is 21 of those engineers and architects that did that building were my former students. And so pretty impressive. That, That's pretty uh, impressive. I don't know that I influenced what they did in that building, but to see them come back and put their passion, their heart into doing something special for the university was, was really important. Yeah, I think uh, you've probably had plenty of chances to interact with former students and colleagues because you've been here for such a long time. And so now let's kind of back up just a little bit to pre-IESB and talk about moving into the presidency position because you've kind of said before that you kind of were groomed in a way to be the president without knowing it, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, each of these roles as you went into them, it was kind of something that you didn't place upon yourself. And so when you were first, I guess, approached, when, when the thoughts started getting thrown around about you being university president, was that something that appealed to you or did you kind of have to be like coaxed into that? I would say there was a little bit of coaxing. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it, it's not been my desire to rise to a different rank. I've loved every opportunity that I've had along the way and I could have seen myself being a, a there for a career, but you know, somebody needed to be the president. And I wanted to see some of the things that Dr. Renault and even Dr. Taylor and others had started uh, to be continue to be developed and built upon. And so I made a decision to apply and, uh, and fortunately for me, I was selected to, to be president. What sort of made you feel ready for a role that you didn't plan on taking on? So why were you confident going into that, that it was something that you could do? long term too, because you ended up doing it for over 10 years. So what, it's something that you would be committed to and ready for. Yeah, you know, Dan Renault did a lot to prepare me. He gave me some difficult tasks along the way. Uh, he saw that, that I would probably have an opportunity to do this. And um, I appreciated the challenging opportunities that he gave me there. And, and he's been a special friend, you know, for many years, much, much different kind of person than I am, but that's that's okay. And President F.J. Taylor was much different than than Dan Renault. But we, if you think about it, we've had seventy five years with just four presidents in right. Louisiana. That's Tech. very uncommon. And we all have different strengths and different personalities, uh, but that consistency of focus on building the university over that period of time, I think, has helped advance Louisiana Tech um, in some significant ways. So you mentioned kind of, you know, learning from Dr. Renault um, as kind of a, a confidence booster going into the role. 
what sort of qualities did you try to embody, not just as a president, but sort of the culture of the university as you sort of moved into it and then over the, the course of that decade? Yeah. You know, he's, um, he's very, he was, he is very passionate about this university and its people. And, and I see the same. And he, he was very challenging and he wanted to, he aspired uh, to make this the greatest it could possibly be. And, and so I've, quite often uh, had him come here and visit with me and guide me, uh, talk, have discussions and help work through some of the, the challenges that I saw coming. So he's, he's been a great friend and supporter, he, he and Linda both. You mentioned, you know, the common thread, uh, a common thread between you guys is the sort of passion for the student body here. And it's very evident, you know, I, I was a student here from 2014 to 2018 and then graduated here and stayed here. And so you've been the president for me as long as I've been here, both as a student and as a staff member. So it was, it's, it was evident to me as a new student that you cared about the student body. And I think that it's clear to anyone who, who, can, who can see that you get sort of energy from being in the quad and talking to students. and and making one-on-one -on -one connections and having sort of essentially an open door for most, most of the students on campus. And I wanna know why that's important to you and why you make an effort to do that because you've created a sort of culture of the students admiring you, but not because that's something you wanted. It just is a, an artifact of what happened because you're so involved as being a part of the students' lives here. So. Why is that important to you and why do you yeah. continue to do that? And probably will continue to do that even after you retire. Yeah, I, You know, you said I created that. I, I didn't create it, I continued it. Uh, I never will forget as a sophomore uh, architecture student walking across that quad campus and coming over here and going into Vice President Virgil Orr's office, who was the provost, so to speak, at that time. and. We were dealing with some issue that I had, but he got to know me there. And when I started walking across the campus one day and he saw me at the Lady of the Mist, he said, hello, Les. You know, and it was that, I mean, I was trying to find my way on campus. And to have somebody that cared like that was, it just made a difference, right? And so, you know, the first day of class, I'm out there every day. Uh, greeting students because I know, you know, they're wandering around, they're trying to figure out what college life is gonna be like and to, and to help them get off to a good start and to feel comfortable on the campus. It just, it's important to me. And I, you know, I think it's important to others as well. And so I like to try to do that. And I like to try to get out each and every day. And I, I interact, try to walk through the Tolliver and walk across the campus mm -hmm. and just uh, greet people and hopefully uh, like to later today I'm going to have some students that I've been walking with they're going to come up here and visit with me and I may be able to give them a little bit of guidance about what career paths they may have ahead. So it's just something I enjoy. It's why I like being at the university. Yeah, it's like I said, I can tell that you kind of get energy from it and <laughs> Uh, it's not, I think maybe, not to say some students take it for granted, but because you've been that way for so long and because it is kind of the culture here that the president himself, you know, the, the highest position at the university is able to be out here, you know, boots on the ground on the quad and, and making small talk with the students on a almost daily basis is kind of just what we see and what we expect because it's been done, but it's, it's easy to think, take that for granted because it's not maybe as common as people realize, but you have been very accessible to students and um, I know you've generated a lot of love from the students for that. Um, I think that sort of ties into my next question, which feeds on kind of this idea of culture, of the Louisiana Tech culture. How do you think, maybe not just even in, in your time as president, but going back to your time as a faculty member, as a dean, how do you think the culture has changed and what parts of the culture have you tried to 
elaborate on and grow and maybe keep, but just sort of improve upon as we move into the future? You know, um, certainly with the tenets of tech that were introduced by Dr. King and Dr. Crawford and all in the early 2000s, really helped put a face on our culture, if you will. Uh, uh, talking about those 12 tenets, those, those 12 words and understanding what, what they mean and how they relate to you in life and tying it together from freshman convocation to graduation when they get that tenant medallion back as they walk, walk across the stage. Those are, you know, we have to build upon those things and they really enhance uh, people's success in life and being able to get through some of the challenges that they're gonna face when they leave here, right? Some of them leaving without jobs maybe or leaving with difficult uh, financial conditions and things. So. Just having that culture is a central part of what we do and, and um, making sure that we uh, are embracing that with our faculty and our staff. And they do, you know. I, I love seeing them lined up at our freshman convocation now welcoming our students to campus. That, that really makes it a special environment. Um, you know, we're talking about culture and we, we just talked about kind of your, your, the way you're accessible to students. And I know that, you know, maybe if you had to pinpoint a date, you, you could say since the pandemic, but in recent years, you've kind of placed this emphasis on health, not just physical health, but mental health. And I know that um, part of you being accessible to the students is kind of part of that mental health, whether you intend for it to be or not. It's, it's, it's doing good in that, in that area, but also your, your Saturday walks with the physical yeah. health. And so, how has that sort of focus tied into the way you've approached your job over the last couple of years? Yeah, it's no question. Uh, even though it's been maybe more challenging, it's been more fulfilling uh, for me over the past uh, four years since April 2019 when the mm -hmm. tornado passed through our campus and we saw uh, the way that our student body and our faculty and our community and the state, everyone responded to that and began to say, we're going to take this on and and uh, get over this, you know. And one of my good friends uh, that I spent a lot of time with challenged me one day. He said, look, Les, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on a diet and I'm going to see if I can get myself healthy here. And this was right after the COVID uh, thing. And so I said I would do that too and started getting out and walking and myself and just. Was it hard at first? Oh, just yeah. like create a new habit out of thin air it, pretty yeah, much? Yeah, it was. And I had trouble walking from the president's house up to the park, you know, it wasn't very far, but uh, I just continued to push myself and challenge myself on that. And, and I saw what it was doing to me emotionally and improving my mental well-being. And so we just, I invited some others to come out and we met at the president's residence and and did a, a walk or two around campus and I don't really quite know how it came about but I said I'm gonna do a Saturday walk and we did and a lot of people showed up and I'm just trying to do it consistently because I get a different group out there every time and um, just make some good friendships that's good for me I feel pumped up when I leave there right. and um, looking forward to the next Saturday when we get together. Yeah, and you also too, you realize what the walking did for your health. Yes. And so you're trying to, you know, get encourage others to be a part of that. Absolutely, I, I think it is. And I see some people that uh, have been on this campus a long time and have not been doing it either. And now they're consistently out, out walking. Yeah, it's an important thing, it is. Um, and your emphasis on it lately has been very clear. Uh, let's talk about tech family because it's a phrase we use. Um, it might be easy for an outsider to dismiss it as kind of a marketing term. I mean, we do kind of use it as a marketing term, but I think if you talk to anyone here, if you talk to a student, faculty, staff member, um, tech family means something to them. That phrase means something to them. And for you, it has meanings in your role as president, but also it has very literal meanings because of your actual family. <laughs> you have created, I think, a quite literal picturesque tech family. Um, so talk about meeting Miss Kathy, 
um, and getting married and sort of raising a, a loyal blue household and kind of why that was not only important to you, but it probably happened organically. So kind of just, just talk yes, about your family did. a little bit. It was real interesting. Kathy and I met in a freshman English class over in Carson Taylor Hall. And, uh, uh, you know, I we didn't have much conversation back then, but I got to know her. I got her best friend was my best friend's uh, friend, and so there you go. You had you had a way in. He, he, he was a fellow architect, and uh, so we spent some time together. And I eventually got a little nerve to ask Kathy to go out on a date, and uh, she was in a sorority, which gave me a chance to appreciate uh, sorority life. And uh, I was in architecture, so it's hard to be an architect and be in a fraternity. But I uh, got to know Kathy, and and. Um, you know, I was I was struggling financially to get through school, and uh, we figured that we could get married, and she was working, and I would work part time, and so we actually did that as juniors and uh, got married, and I guess it worked. We're still yeah. together. Planned it around a football game, right? It, yeah, yeah. So, you know, again, I was a football fanatic. We'd won the national championship in my freshman year and sophomore year, and we my junior year we're in the midst of a being named a national champion that third year and so it's just what we did we went on a bus over to uh, Wichita Falls to watch a football game that but she, we decided to get married on November the 22nd and I said well Kathy that's okay but there's a football game that <laughs> night and so we got married at noon in El Dorado and came down for the football game and and then went on off on our honeymoon to Houston and other places, looking maybe for an architect firm that I could right. work for. Where is point. she from? Where's Miss Kathy She was from? from, well, she was in West Monroe for most okay. of her life, but she moved to El Dorado uh, because of her father's job opportunity at that time. And, um, you know, we were married and living in tech housing uh, as young students. Harper Hall was one of our, room, our facilities in Bettville. Uh, but then uh, after I started teaching, I had my first son, uh, Chad, and, and then I had Kyle and Brett, uh, and all of them wound up getting their degrees at Louisiana Tech, even though I took them around. They were in speech and debate. I was about to say, was, that, was, that, was that, the, I, I assume they had the you know, free will to choose, Absolutely. but they chose Tech for a reason. They I mean. chose Tech. and. Um, you know, we took them to, to Michigan and other places. They were on speech and debate. So they really had a lot of exposure to those other universities, uh, Georgia Tech and all. And I would have been happy if they would have gone there. But I was thrilled when they chose to come to Louisiana Tech. And, you know, as part of that time, I was dean of engineering and my two sons were coming through there. And I didn't want to be looking over their shoulders. So I of uh, kind of stayed clear. You know, they moved into housing over here. so. It was good, but uh, they've all uh, had successful careers. All of them married tech women. So I was about to say, you got you got daughters-in-law <laughs> from tech. So and two of the two of those were daughters of professors at tech. Uh, one was an engineering professor, and one was a mathematics professor. So uh, we've got it in our blood, and uh, it's a passion. They enjoy coming back here and. It's a little more difficult that they're working and having their own children there, but um, that's one of the things in retirement. I'll get to spend a little more time with them. Right, and and grandkids too. Let how I'm guessing you're starting early on the grandkids, getting them ready for tech. Yeah, I hope they <laughs> always come here with Louisiana Tech gear on and uh, cheerleader outfits and things like that. But it, it's it's special for us, you know. We they the boys will come and we'll tailgate and have a good time around ball games. And a lot of our discussion is about Louisiana Tech. Yeah, loyal blue blood, that is for sure. That's for sure. And I think, you know, you mentioned being able to spend time with them after retirement. Let's kind of talk about um, your decision to retire. I know you've said that you felt comfortable announcing that you felt like it was time because mm -hmm. you wanted to leave the university in a good spot where you'd done some things that you'd set out to do and where the university was kind of poised to continue to grow and to kind of leave it in good hands for the next president, which we'll get to. Um, so talk about why you felt that the university was in that place and why you felt comfortable making that decision and kind of the things that have been put in place, maybe recently, maybe it's building, buildings opening or programs being put in place 
that kind of solidified that for you that you felt good about that? Yes, yeah, so, you know, there were some projects that I wanted to see uh, get to the finish line. And, uh, you know, obviously the, the Tech Point Two facility, mm -hmm. our second multi-tenant building on campus and uh, to be able to cut the ribbon on that uh, last week. And then uh, with the Louisiana Tech Research Institute in, in Bossier, uh, that we cut the ribbon on just yesterday is, mm -hmm. you know, those are big things that have national scale impacts for our university. And uh, there were some major activities that the governor announced yesterday that are gonna be taking place over there in Bossier. So I wanted to make sure that that was in, in good hands and, and uh, ready for tenants. And so we've got the structures set up for all of that. Uh, that I feel good about leaving that with the people. And it, and it may look differently than what I see right now, but I feel like we got it, those things to a good point. And, and uh, getting our enrollments back in a positive direction. Mm -hmm. And this year we had our largest freshman class ever. And so that was important to me as well, uh, which is one of the reasons I held off my decision to retire until seeing that we were going to have some success going forward in that. And I think that'll continue on next year as well. And just a number of, of other programs and facilities, you know, looking at George T. Madison, where I took my classes as a freshman and knowing it needed renovation. And now we've got that lined up with the capital outlay and the new Forest Products Innovation Center that's mm -hmm. going to be an addition to our South Campus. And not just there, but support our research and our academic programs that really are so good in the forestry and applied areas of, of um, agriculture there. So there's just trying to get those to a point where they could easily be handed off to someone else was, was what my goal was. Right, and I think, you know, you're talking about Tech Point 2, which is again, part of the enterprise campus that you mentioned earlier. And that's gonna, there's a plan there to kind of continue to grow that with, Absolutely. you know, building down, kind of connecting campus more directly to downtown Ruston. Um, and then LTRI, kind of part of, you know, what we can call our Shreveport Bossier campus in a way, you know. Right. So these areas of campus and then campus itself, having regional, and national sometimes impacts worldwide even. Uh, what have you seen over the course of your whole tech career in terms of tech having those sort of regional and global impacts? And what, what are you excited about for the future of those impacts? Yes, so you know, it really goes back to our faculty and our students that lead those areas. And we've been able to attract them in here, but you know, North Louisiana has a lot of really great people in it. And unfortunately, quite often they get their education and they move out of state mm -hmm. because there aren't the great opportunities to be on the leading edge companies that uh, are career opportunities that they need. And so a lot of our focuses have been built, creating that kind of environment, whether it's working with Lumen and others in Monroe are working with the medical healthcare facilities in Bossier or the cyber activities in Bossier and Shreveport. You know, all of those have been really to help us uh, create a greater future for our state, particularly North Louisiana. And there's more work to do. There's always gonna be more work to do, but I think, I think um, we've been able to make some progress that will uh, give us more opportunities for the future. And I think, um, you know, you mentioned leaving the university in a place where the next person is gonna, is gonna kind of have an opportunity to hit the ground running. Um, and that is gonna be Dr. Jim Henderson. Um, the, you know, he spent most, most of the time over the last few years as the president and CEO of the UL system. So you've had plenty of opportunity to work directly with him. He's kind of been part of the oversight of this university and eight others, you know, as part of that system. So. Um, you know, take this time to kind of tell us about why, why you kind of think that that's a good, a good choice and what your relationship has been like with, yeah. with Dr. Henderson over the last few years. I, I think it's a great choice. And quite honestly, I was greatly relieved when I heard that he had an interest in it. Um, because, you know, we do a lot of complex things around here and, you know, 
for the size of the university we are, this, we've, we've taken on a lot of, of things, a lot of responsibilities and a diverse kind of uh, program base and diverse student body and, you know, and having somebody that could continue to enhance that in their own way uh, was important to me. So Dr. Henderson and I have worked together for 15 years ever since he, uh, even before he came to Bossier Parish Community College as, as their chancellor, I got new in then. But because of our involvement in Shreveport Bossier activities, I've worked with him a lot over that time. And then he went to Northwestern for a couple of years as a colleague. And so we worked together in the UL system. And, and then when he became uh, the head of the system, it was just, he's, he put a whole new uh, system in place that really energized our campuses and brought a lot of our campuses together. We've always been friends with our other presidents, but we we share a lot more uh, than ever. And I attribute that to Dr. Henderson and his leadership. And I know he'll bring that uh, to this campus. He's an excellent leader, excellent communicator. Uh, he's passionate about tech, which you know, I know he's got family roots here. I've often talked about his his father, father and, and mother mm -hmm. and their their ties here back in the Joe I era. Uh, some great great times there. And his son, uh, who I recruited here, thanks to some help from Jim, is now a, a sophomore engineering student. And I just he's Jim has a lot of vision and leadership abilities and a passion that I think is going to carry this university to new heights. That's exciting. And I think too, you know, that him choosing to take on the role here, the presidency, uh, it, it left, you know, the UL system presidency open and concurrently it was announced that Rick Gallo from right down the road at Grambling is going to uh, take that up. And you've worked with, with him oh, oh, sure. over the years. So talk about, you know, Speak, speak on kind of why that's a good good idea. Well, listen, Rick and I are longtime friends. He's, his mom was, uh, was in higher education and got to know her, but Rick and I have been personal friends for, for a long time and working together. And when he became president of Grambling, I mean, one of the first meetings we had was here in this office and started talking about how we could begin to collaborate at an even higher level. Grambling had gone through quite a bit of transition in presidents, and so to be able to bring him in, and and over these past several years, it's just been really a, a great thing. Um, he'll come over and bring his family. His wife is a Tech alum, and w they'll come enjoy us at the football suite, watching Louisiana Tech football if, mm -hmm. if the Tigers are not in town or not playing. And so, we usually do that once or twice a year, but. Uh, and we've also worked in areas like cyber, and he he put a cybersecurity degree program there, which is really helping advance some this much uh, open opportunity for us in North Louisiana with cyber. And we put cyber engineering in place, and both working together on that. So I hate to see him leaving right. as a neighbor here, but uh, he'll still keep his eyes on on Grambling and, and will do a great job as a system president. I have no doubt about it. Yeah, so they, you know, we're kind of touching on these leaders and we've talked about you and, you know, everybody in a leadership role, especially a prominent one, kind of leaves a legacy behind. And I've gone back and forth on how to kind of ask you the big legacy question. And I know you've been asked, what do you want your legacy to be here? And what do you want your time to be here remembered as? And I think it's clear from talking to you how you feel about your time here and you tie you as a leader at Tech to the university itself. And so I think when, the way I'm gonna frame this question is not necessarily what do you want your legacy to be as president here, but what do you want the university's legacy to be during your time here? Wow, um, that, that's, that's a challenging question. I, I would say uh, a, the legacy of taking excellence and turning it into impact for our region. Um, we've had great impacts, but I think the opportunity for us to have even greater impacts 
for the future are there now because of some of the things that our team has put in place. Here, across the I-20 corridor, across the state, uh, and the nation with some of the, some of the programs that we put in place. So I, I would think it's the impact. Yeah, we, there's a phrase that we try to attach to, you know, a lot of the stories that we tell about our programs here and about the research being done here and about what our students are doing and our faculty and staff are doing and it's unparalleled educational yeah. experience. And I know that you had a hand in kind of coining that phrase. Um, what does that phrase mean to you and why is it evident to you on this campus? Yeah. And, and I didn't come up with that phrase. I was part of the team that um, embraced it and, and uh, developed it, but it was doing something that others couldn't do or didn't do, you know, creating something unparalleled that whether it's an ac academic program that students choose to uh, participate in because it gives them unparalleled opportunities, or faculty members that are able to advance research in, in leading areas uh, and having an impact through their research, and then our community uh, looking at the unparalleled opportunities to grow and thrive. Uh, I think what we're seeing here in Ruston with the partnership with the mayor and looking at, you know, we're spending some time now doing some regional planning about what, what all happens. That'll be one of the things I spend my time on after the presidency is working with the community more and seeing how we leverage these investments that the state has made in Louisiana Tech and our people have made in Louisiana Tech. Uh, to see how we take that to another level. So last question for you, we're talking kind of, we're kind of hinting at the future. And I know uh, even as you step away from the presidency, from the university in that capacity, that the groundwork that you've laid during your time here is gonna continue to be expounded upon uh, into the future. So the Tech 2030 plan, the framework for, you know, the strategic plan of how the university is intended to grow, mm -hmm. Talk about that and sort of why those plans are important to be put in place for sort of long-term strategic yeah. goals. You know, the, I did not write uh, the Tech 2030. Everyone wrote it. Everyone, Everyone at the wrote, university wrote it. Everyone did. And, and the contributions of people coming together, you know, we began to set directions and it builds off of the things that we put together in our Tech 2020 strategic plan. Uh, but we're about three years into the Tech Tech 2030 plan. We, we've identified our focus areas for this year and I'm confident that uh, the people are going to maybe reshape it a little bit as, as you get new leadership in here, and, but I'm confident that that's going to serve as uh, a basis for making really good decisions for the future. So Dr. Geis, what's the first trip you're going to take after you retire? <laughs> To go see family. Yeah, for I'm sure. I'm going to go see some family. I've been remiss in getting over to Houston and Dallas where my sons live. We're going to try to get over there as soon as possible. Well, I speak for everyone when I say that we wish you the best and that we hope that you enjoy retirement. And we know that you will always be a part of the tech community. I mean, how could you not be? I think I was telling you before we started recording that you're you're like the most tech tech person that we've had as part of the faculty here. And I know that you do it all for the university though. Yeah, I just represent a lot of other people that have had similar feelings and similar commitments to me. And, um, but I'm honored to be a part of this and um, I'll be standing by to support Dr. Henderson and others as, as much as they need me. Well, thank you for your time, not just here today, but as president, as a faculty member, as a student even, I mean, like you said, over 50 years so it goes it goes back um so thank you for everything and enjoy retirement doctor thank nice. you much thank you. gavin appreciate it